Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. Hello, friends. Kirk Anderson and Josh Bow coming to you on Wednesday, January 19th, just before 10.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. The Mavericks have just held off a ridiculously feisty Toronto Raptors team, 102-98. to How are we doing, Josh? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, this felt like a nice comfort food Mavericks win that we haven't gotten in a while. I mean... These incredible blowouts and beating really good teams by like 17 points and holding all these really good teams to under 100 points is fun and new and, and interesting. But uh, boy, it was it was kind of funny. It was kind of fun to also see like a like a Mavericks game that I that could have happened, you know, last season or the season before, uh, where Luca kind of does everything. Uh, no one else really does much beyond him and then he kind of just takes over in the fourth like it's been a long time since we had a game like that like that yeah. was a very good i mean it was the best luca game of the season and uh it's been a long it's been it's been a long time coming uh we were due for a luca show like that so i don't know how much our, our like website and podcast audience overlaps but i wrote a piece about when i was at the game uh, on monday against the thunder and getting to watch Luca up close, and one of my big takeaways from the from watching Luca is I don't think, at least this year, I don't think he's used his strength near enough because he's just really good at getting to to certain spots and then using his his ability to to unleverage an uh, opposing defender, and he he takes certain shots that are easier, and uh, well that that basically result in less contact, and I completely understand why. But I felt tonight against the Raptors, a great deal of his shot attempts were him going towards the basket. Not, and I mean beyond the threes, which were great that that they fell. But a lot of his, you know, he had some rim looks that were nice, like really like just authoritative basketball from Luca, which was nice to see because I think he's been almost selfish to a fault, and he, I think he's probably going to have in the neighborhood of twenty to twenty five potential assists from this game, where like nobody's hitting anything from from his you know, from his teammates outside of um, basically Porzingis. And it was just sort of a struggle to watch like everyone else miss shots and Luca put them up. And it was just nice to see Luca use the fact that he is the best player on the basketball floor to, to his advantage. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, hell, I mean, he was good everywhere. I mean, he was good start to finish. Like that was something that was really nice to see also because, you know, that Memphis game, he finished really strong in that second half, but he had a really, really terrible first half. And it's been a long time since we've seen a, like a start to finish great Luca game. Uh, yeah, it's just it's been a rough month. I mean, for he hadn't him, scored. So. He hadn't scored over thirty since November twelfth. That's nearly. I mean, two full months. Basically, yeah. 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 I mean, that's crazy. Um, so so good. You know, that was good. Um. And, you know, I think it was really fun to just kind of see him finally kind of put on a show in the fourth quarter. He had 11 points, made two threes. Um, you know, he carried the team, put him on his, on his back because no one else was making any shots. I mean, I'm looking at the fourth quarter numbers right now. Uh, and Luca was three of five from the floor. 
Brunson was 0 of 2. Kristaps was 0 of 2. Finney Smith 0 of 1. Bullock was 1 of 4. <laughs> like, it was a really uh, difficult quarter for them outside of Luca. So it was good down the stretch that Luca was like, okay, you know, let's, let's, let's go home. Uh, and it was good to see them to pull it out. And like you said, a feisty Raptors team. Uh, I'm, you know, credit to this Raptors team. I, when the Mavericks pulled away uh, to end the third quarter, I really thought that that was it. And that the Mavericks were maybe going to have a comfortable fourth quarter because the Raptors are playing a seven man rotation and the seventh man played 16 minutes. <laughs> um, they played a regulation NBA game with four players playing over 40, 42 minutes. Or and more. nobody fouled out, which yeah. I don't understand. Cause it, it felt like there were a thousand foul calls in this yeah, game. There was, they had a two, they had two guys with five fouls, another guy with four. So they got close, but uh, they, they were so tired in that fourth quarter. And, and you could tell, cause they, they had no legs in their jumpers. They shot eight of 32 from three. Uh, I know the Mavericks defense is good, but you know, three point defense is, is, is a lot of a lot of variance there that sometimes the defense can't control, and you could just right. they had heavy legs. I mean, they could not make. I mean, they just could not make any jumpers. So, the fact that they were able to to keep this a close game in the fourth quarter and and then legitimately have chances to win in the final minute was really impressive. And like, I think that was more. I mean, we can glass half full, uh, glass half empty. Look at it, but I to me it was more just like that was more impressive from the Maverick side than it was like oh no the Mavericks were almost choked away a game like obviously the Mavericks did not do some good things in the fourth quarter but I just thought it was a wildly entertaining and competitive game for, yeah. for the most part yeah um and you know I don't really like I have some like criticisms but they're all sort of light in the sense where you know it, it we should have all predicted this Dorian game after he had just a litany of well-deserved praise coming from Jim Rome, the wall street journal. We wrote a couple of great pieces on him. I mean, Dorian's playing unbelievable basketball right now. And the same thing happened to Jalen Brunson last year when SI covered how he was basically like a God near the rim. And then all of a sudden he couldn't hit, couldn't hit a broad side of a barn. I mean, Dorian was, it was, he missed two alley-oops like that. You know, what do you do with that? It, it, it was yeah. sometimes you just have a stinker of a game. And like the, the more alarming one for me was Maxi Kleba who gave Dallas 25 absolutely useless minutes he had two turnovers, zero points. He really had three turnovers. He threw a hand grenade at Porzingis uh, in the final minute of the fourth quarter as they were trying to play keep away. Like, just really surprising to see Maxi play that level of basketball. He tweaked his knee against the Thunder, and that's why he missed the rest of that game. But he didn't look like he was moving badly. He just looked like he wasn't ready to play basketball. Yeah, it was it's odd. Really- I was really concerned in the final minute or two when he did the Ben Simmons. You said he threw a hand grenade to Chris Stops and it reminded me of the Ben Simmons play in the playoffs against the Hawks where he passed up an open dunk. I mean, I I meet, might need to see the replay to see how open of a lane he had, but it really looked like he had a chance to at least get a, you know, a layup or something. And then to, to throw that pass to Chris Stops was really concerning. Yeah, and I mean, you know, when I say throwback Maverick win, it's also a throwback to – these hilarious box scores where Luca has like all of the star- starter stats and, and and the other the rest of the guys don't do much. I mean, Kristaps had a had a decent enough game. Uh, he had a pretty good game. He, but, he didn't uh, play well down the fourth, but yeah. no one in the Mavs did. So what do you do? Right, but the other three starters combined for seventeen points, uh, which is just hard to do, and it's really funny. It, it, it just seems like the Mavericks have box scores like that regularly. And I mean, I don't. Well, follow. they used to. It's yeah, been better to, this year. It's been, yes, it has. Because Brunson's been in the starting lineup. He's been better. Finney Smith is averaging a career high in points. So you're right. It has been better. So this was like a night. This was kind of like a throwback game well, uh, in a sense there. While we're kind of throwing out. And again, I want to emphasize that like this is light criticism after a win where the Mavericks played. They won their fourth game in six days, which is really important because they play the Suns tomorrow night and might get rolled. Um and it's just it's it's when I when we say these sorts of things, it's mainly because we want to, you know, examine this game from top to bottom and not have a five minute long podcast. So this was another really interesting game for me for the Jalen Brunson watch where I continually waffle back and forth between wanting to pay him all the money in the world. And then I see what happens whenever lengthy defenders guard him. Um, 
he's his shot making ability is so impressive. So I don't want to to take anything away from that because he he's had such incredible games this year. It's just this one was a struggle bus. I mean, his assist to turnover ratio continues to be just sterling, like four assists, one one turnover tonight. It's just kind of odd to see him with eight points on 11 shots, which means that like the Toronto, Toronto basically put him in a bit of a prison in terms of not fouling him and forcing him into difficult looks. Yeah, and it's and Toronto is a particularly gruesome matchup because it's not just all the length and, you know, OG and Anobi and and Pascal Siakam. It's not just that. It's also, you know, Fred Van Vliet is... Yep. Who's bigger, pound, who's longer than people think. Yeah, pound for pound, you know, a really great defender. Uh, so you've got him and then you've got his, you know, the back line behind him with OG and Pascal. Like, that's just... That's a tough matchup for Jalen. And the thing that I continue to look at that I think that this will be something he needs to get better at. And I'm not the only one who said this, but uh, you know, his three point shot, he's shooting 27.8% from three in the month of January. He was 0 for two tonight. He was 0 for three uh, against the thunder. And then even in wins, you know, like in the, the Orlando win, he was one for one, the Memphis win, he took no threes. Uh, and I continue to be alarmed. A little, not I mean, alarmed is is too strong. But him keep, hitting him hitting threes unlocks something else. Yes, yes, it, and it, and it, it it backs off these defenses that you know these lengthy. You know, if he if he's going against lengthy defenses and athletic guys and guys that are bigger and longer that can contest him better at the rim and in mid range, like you know, the counter to that is you know being able to. Uh, fire out of the pick and roll from the three-point line um, mm-hmm. and be able to back defenses off with a good three-point shot because right now they're not really concerned and they're just playing you know his mid-range and his uh, rim game which is why it's so remarkable that he's putting up the numbers that he is like it just goes to show how great of a shot maker he is and it's just really weird because he like he shot more he had a higher three-point rate uh, in college than he does in the NBA and it's been really weird like like he this kind of like you know old school mid-range throwback game that he's he showcased as a maverick like i, I mean he he had that in, in villanova obviously but he he was like a shooter in Vill- like he he shot threes in college like regularly and he would hit 40 you know hit 40 percent of them uh and and take like three or four a game which is more than like the two that he two or three he's taking this season and when you consider the college games a little shorter uh I, I looked at some data like two months ago and of all the guards that play like major minutes, you know, it's like him and Chris Paul have like the lowest three point rates among guards that are, you know, minutes, you know, that have uh, a high, you know, starter level minutes uh, played this season. And, you know, that's great for Chris Paul, Hall of Fame player who has, you know, just rode that type of game through his career with Brunson. It's like, I, you know, can he follow that? I don't know. That's a tough, that's tough to follow, you know, try to be like, Hey, well, if Chris Paul did it, he can do it. Like that's tough. That's a really uh tough path to follow. Cause you gotta be one of the, you know, one of the greater greatest point guards of the generation, which uh, Paul is. Uh, so just something to, to look at. I'm, I'm spending way too much time talking about this in a Mavericks win, but uh, yeah, the three point no, shot, it, it's, but this that's, is sort of that's the next thing for him. For yeah, sure. this is this is I, I know for a fact this is why people like listening to us because again we're like very this was a good win. God, Fred Van Vliet took 15 three pointers. My yeah, goodness. He took some um, bad ones. <laughs> yeah. I mean it, it's some bad ones. It's you know, the, the things that, that I'm kind of curious about now that we're towards the end of this is um Wednesday afternoon was a weird, you know, Wednesday day was just um Jason Kidd, good basketball coach, which fine. Like the Mavericks are 26 and 19. Like they're winning games. They're looking a lot better. Um, then there were stretches of this game that had me wondering what they were doing with some of their rotations. Like Tim Hardaway Jr. played a lot, 27 minutes. He had 16 points and was still a negative one. And he got his ass roasted on defense. Like to the point to where in the first 14 minutes of the game, the the Raptors had 26 paint points and six of them in the in the opening minute of the of the uh, second quarter were all on Tim. It was just uh, it was o- OG uh, Ananobi just roasting Tim alive. I think is what it was, and I couldn't understand how that was even a matchup. And and I know Kid has talked about this. Like he talked about it in the pregame where he's like, I want to let these guys play through problems. We know Tim is not a good defender. If you can get away with it, okay. 
But like that was in a game decided by four points. Like that, that's the sort of stuff that makes me go, mm, can we, can we not experiment to that level? <laughs> what, what am I overthinking this? No, no. For, it was very, I, I don't, I can't remember in the, in the second half, if it, if it continued as, as much. I think it they didn't. Maybe. I mean, it did okay. the fourth, but the third yeah. quarter was better. Like from the, from the 10 minute mark to halftime, the Mavericks did not allow a paint point. And then they allowed 20 more in the second half, which was, you know, it is what it is, but it was, it was an onslaught to start the game and then it stopped. Yeah, it was, it was, it was definitely weird to see the first half and see Hardaway regularly match up against OG, like considering the other options that are on the floor. Um, I mean, I guess it makes it tough. Like if, if you don't put them on OG, you know, you're not putting it on, putting on Siakam, you're not putting him on, uh, you know, Fred Van Vliet. Uh, maybe you put them on Scotty Barnes, I guess. Uh, but it, Toronto, you know, Toronto is just so big and like it's just kind of worrisome because yeah, it's like where else do you put them? Uh, but you know, OG, you know, on a night where the Raptors did not score well, you know, OG was eight of sixteen from the floor and scored nineteen points. So uh, yeah, that that was that was weird, and that's happened before. And when you've got Finney Smith and you've got Bullock, you would think that would that would leave opportunities for Tim to be guarding a team's like second or third best offensive option to a minimum. But yeah, for mm-hmm. whatever reason, the first half, uh, the Mavericks were, were rolling that out, but you know, at the end of the day, Raptors shot under 40% from the field and scored 98 points. So they, they figured it out and they did, they did what they needed to do. Yeah. This, this sort of strikes me as a game where they go look at film and they see lots of Dorian miscues and like, long rebounds going to certain guys where they got crushed for me was they they would play good defense give up a a reasonable shot then give up an offensive rebound and then Toronto would run another mid pick and roll and they'd score and it's like if you play if you play good defense and force up the first tough shot you gotta get the board I mean 16 of Toronto's 44 rebounds were offensive like that's like the Mavericks can't be can't be letting that happen like yeah I'm just I mean, imagine stuff. imagine what the Raptors' final score would have looked like if the Mavericks cleaned up the Oh, yeah, the they, yeah. I mean, they would have won this game by maybe 15 points, and the Raptors might not have scored 80. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Which is crazy. Well, like, right, but that, and that's kind of why we're, we're nitpicking, because the Mavericks, there were at least three different points in this game where it felt like the Mavericks were going to run away with it. But between turnovers, where they had 16, which is high for them, and then yeah. offensive boards given up, where they had 16 – like Toronto just managed to stay hanging around. So, yeah. And that's, you know, Nick nurse is a great coach and they've got some guys that, you know, they play hard and they're just athletic as all get out. And yeah, I mean, it's, you take care of business. Uh, I mean, they're about to start whole, the, the next three games are really, really difficult games. So uh, again, you know, being able to bank this one before they start these three games against uh, Western playoff contenders, uh, not not playoff contenders, title, you know, conference finalist contenders, uh, is is pretty nice. Yeah. Well, fun is fun. These these games yeah. have been fun. Winning is genuinely fun. Uh, Luca made Evan a clutch and... three from the left wing. He hasn't Woo! done that in a while. So I didn't even try to defend it. It's like he <laughs> saw the step back and was like, "Fuck." <laughs> yep. <laughs> That was funny. Well, I, I'm having a good time with this, and you know, we we've been making this joke all season. Um, our our downloads are up when the Mavericks win. Uh, so they we're are. we always get a kick out of this whenever they're winning, despite uh some people thinking that we want them to lose, which is not the case. I've had a I've had a good time with this, and we'll be back uh, tomorrow night for a. It's just this a nationally televised game. I can't remember. Um, yeah, TNT. Ooh, the early TNT game. This is what I'm talking about. Outstanding. Josh and I will be back in less than 24 hours then. Do you got anything else before we head out? No. Nah, uh, let's hope the national TV ESPN TNT ABC record uh, doesn't Continues come. Continues to uh-huh. improve. <laughs> yes. Nowhere to go but up because right. I think they're two and nine. So. There you go. 
All right, Kirk Henderson, Josh Bow, Mavs Moneyball After Dark. Be sure to rate and review. Also, be sure to consider giving the Green Room app a listen. We do these live post game shows after. I think they're fun. Um, I really enjoy hearing from new Mavs fans. I try to. We seem to be basically getting one or two new people to try the every every night that we do one of these. It's an easy thing to download. You follow me at Kirk Henderson, and then you can join the the audio and ask questions and argue. It's it's a great time, and it's much more productive than staring at social media. So we'll talk to you guys soon and have a good uh, Thursday.